Unknown Fields is a nomadic design studio that ventures out on expeditions into the shadows cast by the contemporary city to uncover the alternative worlds, alien landscapes, industrial ecologies, and precarious wilderness set in motion by the powerful push and pull of the world's desires. The dislocated landscapes we survey, the iconic and the ignored, the excavated, irradiated, and the pristine, are connected to our everyday lives in surprising and complicated ways. They are embedded in global systems that form a vast network of elusive tendrils, twisting thread-like over everything around us, crisscrossing the planet, connecting the mundane to the extraordinary. Unknown fields make provocative objects and films from this expedition work exploring the dispersed narratives that coalesce to form a contemporary city. Our material things set in motion a vast planetary scale infrastructure. They carve holes like canyons. They move mountains. They remake our world from the scale of the pixel to the scale of the planet. Our city casts shadows that stretch far and wide. We tell tales from the dark side of the city. Stories form a notional road trip to a reimagined city that stretches across the earth. We create portraits in a place that sits between documentary and fiction. A city of fragments, of drone footage and hidden camera investigations of interviews and speculative narratives, of toxic objects, reimagined landscapes and distributed matter from distant sites. The dark side of the city is a collection of stories from the constellation of elsewheres that are conjured into being by the city's wants and needs, fears and dreams. Across the last 10 years, Unknown Fields has undertaken 14 expeditions through the distributed territories that lie behind the scenes of contemporary city. Aboard a cargo ship, following the trail of our electronics through the South China Seas, the shipping ports, factory floors and rare earth excavations of China. On a dust blown road trip through the gold and aluminium mines of the Australian outback. Through the irradiated wilderness of the Chernobyl exclusion zone to the precarious wilderness of the Wild West gemstone fields of Madagascar, through the lithium mines of the charged landscapes of Bolivia and Chile, the climate change landscapes of far north Alaska, and to all the sites on the edges of the world where our technologies begin and end their lives. These stories will construct a notional journey from the point of sale to the hole in the ground, it's a journey that is stitched together using footage from some of the places unknown fields have visited across the last few years. So we are going to narrate a set of stories for you tonight to connect the landscapes of the world to the contents of your pockets. Unknown Fields chronicles our electric landscape. We investigate the infrastructures that serve as energy conduits, translating matter like a luminous language from a hole in the ground to the glow of our phones. To trace a wild journey of electrons from the radiant gizmos of our technologies deep into landscapes far, far away. This fiction is an account of a new creation story of our energy from the Big Bang to the Battery, from the birth of lithium at the beginning of the universe to the low power warning flashing on our screens. We power our future with the breast milk of volcanoes. In the beginning, the beginning of the beginning, seconds from zero, 
13.8 billion years ago, the creation story of lithium begins. It was there at the dawn of time, alongside helium and hydrogen, just one of only three elements able to claim their ultimate origin in that hot, dense, primordial gas. Light is the only detectable record that is left of the Big Bang. It is the ghost of lithium creation. At five kilometers above sea level, on the Chajnantor Plateau in the Chilean Atacama Desert, the landscape has eyes. 66 white pupils turn in unison to search the thin air of these dark skies. Here, the astrophysicists at Atacama's Large Millimeter Array Observatory are focused skyward, traveling deep through the dark interstellar clouds of the coldest, oldest parts of the universe. Another community of nomadic shepherds, the indigenous Lekanante people, used to own this land and trekked across the grounds where the antenna now stand. Silhouetted against the light of the Milky Way, the dark clouds that Alma observe are the same shadow constellations of indigenous mythology. Dancing within a swathe of the interstellar cloud that forged lithium is Yakana the Lama, her baby and her shepherd. These creatures have trampled lithium, the lightest of metals from the beginning of time to the crust of the earth. 4.6 billion years ago, as Yakana drank from the sky, the wreckage of an exploding supernova slowly began to condense into our planet. In this vast cloud of swirling cosmic matter, gravity and violent collapse gave shape to the sphere of the Earth, and embedded within it were the traces of lithium. Lithium comprises seven parts per million of the planet's crust, locked in the ground waiting for release, an electric earth. The Salt Lake was once a vast plain where the Incan giants lived. Among them was the beautiful Tunipa. She chose to marry Cuzco, a strong young man, and a son called Kalakatin was soon born of their union. While away on one of his train journeys, Cuzco became infatuated with a pretty young woman, and they ran off together, never to return. The gods tired of the giant's lies, secrecy and betrayal, and they decided to punish them all and petrified them as mountains. The Tunipa began to cry, a volcano spewing ash and rock from the depths of the planet, rich in light elements like magnesium, potassium, boron, and lithium. While the tears rolled down her cheeks, her breasts began to lose the milk that her son had not suckled. Millennia of meltwater from the snow-capped peaks of her mountains seeped down through her rocky sides leaching minerals into the lake below. As the giants became volcanoes, Tunipa's tears ran into the subterranean brine and her milk crystallized as the crusty salt skin that now stretches endlessly across the plateau. This charged landscape, this electric earth, remote and unforgiving, is now quantified for its energy potential. Cities, industries and infrastructures will feed at the shores of this ancient lake, playing out our electric future. The future of green energy is made from the tears and the milk of a mother mountain. It was a little over 20 years ago that lithium erupted again in the Saladini. A Belgian construction company found a ground too soft for construction, but inadvertently had cracked open the earth to reveal the lithium-rich brine below. 
A hundred million tons of Tunipas forgotten tears are now estimated to be trapped here. Without the knowledge and assistance of foreign companies, it has taken over 20 years, but now Bolivia is ready and the Salar is soon to be industrialized. This natural wonder has become the most lucrative of investments and has cast Bolivia as the Saudi Arabia of the electric age. You cannot see it on the desperately flat horizon or access it by any public road. Its mystery is protected by its isolation. Lithium development is not mining through extraction, but through evaporation. A tessellated ocean of evaporation ponds where each shift in hue signals a rising concentration of lithium salts. The shores of the Metal Sea begin at pond number 15, 0.2% lithium, the least concentrated. Azure blue in a sodium chloride beach. Each month the ponds are drained and transferred to the next in line, and each month the colour changes and the lithium gets richer. Across 15 months the sea migrates through the holding ponds of the Salar until it reaches the deep coffee waters of pond number one, 6% lithium sulphate. What is left behind is massive quantities of table salt which is piled up beside the lithium ocean and gradually a new mother mountain grows. What will we call her, this crystal volcano? A totem for a sacrificial sea, evaporating to keep the screens glowing and the wheels turning. This sea, that has been slowly evolving across billions of years, is now ready to leave the land of giants forever. Sucked up by a convoy of thirsty 18-wheelers and driven off the Salar to the lithium carbonate factory to be processed into batteries. The creation story of a battery has become the creation of a nation. vibrates across the earth, the iPhone 9 can travel 14 hours on its 1810 milliamp lithium polymer battery before it comes to rest. It feels warm to the touch, and we are told stories about its lightness and its slim lines. Reflected in its pristine polished glass is the mirrored expanse of the crystal white salt lake from which it has been wrenched. Nearly 9 billion mobile phones in the world are powered by lithium-ion batteries. 5 to 10 grams of tunipers tears and breast milk is contained in each and every iPhone. <coughs> in ludicrous mode, the 7,000 lithium nickel cobalt aluminium oxide cells of the 900 kilowatt hour battery pack that sits in the belly of the newly born Tesla P90D delivers enough power to accelerate from 0 to 60 miles per hour in 2.8 seconds. 20 to 30 kilograms of lithium are at the core of each electric car. Three electrons orbit the lithium nucleus. Our story began with the travels of stars and ends with these tiny revolving planets just waiting for a charge. Unknown fields 
have built the glass battery, a mythic love story that trickle charges a phone. While the world does its best to ignore that technology is forged from the earth, with marketing campaigns of ephemeral clouds and the relentless push for the smallest and lightest, this object embodies the story of the landscape in which it was made. A mass of alternating aluminium and graphite, anode and cathode, submerged in a lithium brine electrolyte, collected from Bolivia's electric Salada Uni, creates a slow reaction, the drip charge of a weeping volcano. The creation myth of this landscape is told again and again as the electrons flow. The flash of the Big Bang to the flash of an electron. Our future is powered by the breast milk of volcanoes. Our cities are extraordinary constellations of products, goods and technologies. From the smallest and most inconsequential object to the most intricate and complex, these material things set in motion a vast planetary scale infrastructure. Our cities cast shadows that stretch far and wide. In a world of bytes and bitcoins, cyberspace and clouds, 90% of the world's cargo still travels by sea. It's not beamed or teleported or conjured into existence along strings of fibre optics, but rather it is dragged across the planet in heaving steel megaships, gizzards full of glistening gadgets and gizmos from distant lands. The secret lives of objects span across a notional factory floor that reaches from the high street pound shop all the way to the resource fields in the Far East. Anon fields travel to China and beyond, tracing the shadows of the world's desires across the China seas and along supply chains and cargo routes to explore the dispersed choreographies and atomized geographies that global sea trade brings into being. These are the contours of our distributed city, stretched around the earth, from the hole in the ground to the high street shelf. Our journey through East Asia marked a cross-section of this supply chain. From source to sea, we followed the roots of this and that, of bits and bobs and thingamajigs. It's been just over 45 years since the Apollo moon landings. And some would have it that we are failing to build big anymore. Stand on the bridge of a container ship docked in a megaport in Korea, however, and it's clear that that's just not true. 5,000 ships make up the global container fleet. 3.6 million containers are in motion worldwide. The surfaces of our planet's oceans. For centuries, a space of myth and mystery of expanse and desolation have been rationalized. Once an enigmatic, awe-inspiring place, the sea has now become a zone of efficiency, little more than another channel for the automated supply chain network. The captain of our ship tells us that years ago, the sea used to be filled with phosphorescent algae that would glow when the waters were disturbed. As the captain says, we would leave this luminous green trail behind us in the water as the motors churned up the algae. Toilets are flush with seawater, and you could turn the lights off in the bathroom and flush the loo, and the whole room would glow neon green. Nobody on the ship knows what lies inside the containers the ship carries. This ship is called the New Dream. It's almost finished. The ship captain and the portside crane operators have been made obsolete. They're now just passengers in the machine, their bodies repurposed as a component in the landscape scale robot 
that stacks the containers ready for transport, bringing our goods all the way home. Before objects set sail for our stores, they are bought, sold and traded in the vast halls of Yibu International Trade City, a wholesale market the size of a city. The wholesale city consists of 80,000 shops, all identically sized 2.5 metre by 2.5 metre cubes, containing 10 million products stretched across 10 square kilometres. Sorry, we can't do it, a market trader says. My minimum order is 100,000. We understand who we are through the trail of objects we leave behind. Shenzhen makes 90% of the world's electronics. These are the human machines of the production line, all choreographed by efficiency algorithms, and their bodies are matched in speed to the conveyor belt that turns in front of them. These are the real robots of our cities of technology. As we follow the technology, we arrive at a village organised around metals and hardware components. The inhabitants of Goyu collect the e-waste in their houses, surrounding their living, sleeping and eating spaces, mining their domestic landscapes for lead, germanium, gallium, tin, nickel and copper. Next to the pot of noodles simmers the acid bath, dissolving circuit wafers and separating metals and flavouring soup. And finally, we arrive at the shores of the 10 square kilometre mine tailings waste lake filled with a cocktail of acids, heavy metals, carcinogens and radioactive material roughly three times background radiation. China produces over 95% of the world's rare earth, and two-thirds of it in Balta. This is some of the first footage of the toxic waste lake that sits beside the world's largest rare earth mineral refinery. We take a selfie with our phones, and we see our reflection in the mirrored screen. The material to polish its glass and run its software produces this very lake and collapse together in a single luminous surface we see ourselves on this black, black earth. We brand our technologies with terms like cloud, air and featherweight, but in reality they are violently wrenched from the earth. As our personal electronics tend towards the invisible, they conjure in their shadows an undeniably visible grey mountain a one kilometre deep pit and a ten kilometre radioactive tailings lake, all a counterweight to the apparent immateriality of computing, communications and electric energy. From this black sludge, we've made a set of vases made from the amount of waste created in the production of three objects, an iPhone, a MacBook and a cell of a Tesla electric battery. A new material aesthetic for technology born of the earth. In silhouette, the three vases echo highly valuable Ming Dynasty porcelain vases. Ming vases are particularly iconic objects of high value, as well as being artifacts of international trade. The Ming Dynasty, a one family global superpower, presided over an international network of connections, trade, and diplomacy. These three rare earthenware vessels are the physical embodiment of a contemporary global supply network that displaces earth and weaves matter across the planet. They represent the undesirable consequences of our material desires. We have followed the unmaking of these objects of technology reversing their journeys from container ships and ports 
through wholesalers and factory floors, all the way back to the banks of the barely liquid radioactive lake in Inner Mongolia that is continually pumped with tailings from the rare earth refinery process. The unmaking of our technologies is the making of these vases, carefully crafted from their toxic byproducts. Our cities cast shadows that stretch far and wide. In Treasured Island, Unknown Fields travels through Madagascar to catalogue the push and pull of economy and ecology and meet the illegal traders of the world's luxury brands. One of the planet's most precious ecological treasures is home to one of its poorest nations and it raises difficult and complex questions about the relationship between necessity and luxury. Hidden amidst political uncertainty, the island's fragile and unique ecology is being smuggled out illegally, boat by boat, gem by gem. Rare tortoises leave in rucksacks. Forests are carved into one million dollar rosewood beds to be sold in China. And precious stones are shoveled from the earth and smuggled onto the stage in pop star bling. As the beat drops and the stage lights strobe, a pop star flashes their designer bling for the camera in a flurry of choreographed dance moves. Another world away, in a hole in the ground in the wild mess mining towns of Ilikaka, Madagascar, another choreographies of bodies move in rhythm to dig dirt by hand out of a gemstone mine. The majority of the world's sapphires are pulled out of the ground by the human conveyor belts of Madagascar's gem fields. For such a remote island, it contains an extraordinary amount of high-value resources. Precious gems were deposited here by an ancient river that once flowed across Africa, before a tectonic shift ripped it from the mainland to form the island of Madagascar and the stones collected in a pocket along the twists and turns of the riverbed, resting patiently beneath 20 metres of sand in the future boomtown of Ilikaka. We dig holes to try and find the river again. These are the words of Mark Novera, one of the major players in present-day Ilikaka. One of the only Europeans in town, he moved here 18 years ago, chasing the stones, hunting his fortune. He's the anonymous face reflected in every piece of jewellery you own. I like stone better than humans, and I like stone better than money. In 1999, he drove into Ilakaka to live in a tent and watch the place explode. When he first arrived, there was only one building here, and now the landscape is overrun with almost 100,000 miners. There's only one road in or out, and it's lined with gem shops, and sweaty men with guns on their hip. I finance the pit. Here in Ilakaka, the land is free. All you need to mine is a local arrangement with the chiefs and elders. There is no government here. There is nothing. There is thousands of people, but it's the most lonely place in Madagascar. This is a landscape produced from unregulated desires. If you want to mine with machines, you need a formal contract and money for fuel and maintenance. To dig with people, you don't need anything, just a bag of rice. 
Each worker gets $2 a day to work in the mines of 50 grams of rice. And with that, one cubic metre of earth equals one gram of gemstone. Here their movements are traced, like the early photographic studies of Frank Gilbreth. He was mapping the choreographies of the production line, looking to optimise every movement, constrain every motion with the elegance of a tuned engine. The digger is a robot, just one component in the gemstone conveyor belt. 2,880 shovels per day, 5.76 tonnes per day. Here it's much cheaper to pay workers in rice than it is to buy and maintain mechanical mining equipment. The 20 men of his Swiss bank mine shovel dirt in perfect synchronisation, each paid with rice, their bodies repurposed as machines. This mine took 12 years to dig by hand. This is my hole, says one of the miners. I started digging four years ago. Every hole here was made by our hands. If you're lucky, you find a good sapphire and you have a good life. With no luck, you die, or you grow old digging holes. Les stones, sapphire, le diamant, ouais. When we find a stone, we all go together to the Sri Lankans to sell it and split the money. We don't know what happens to them or the stones. We don't know how much money they sell them for. The money never comes back to us. Everyone else with money in this town is Sri Lankan. The cultural relationship to sapphire runs deep in Sri Lanka. Embedded within this tradition, Sri Lankan sapphires sell at a much better price than the Madagascan stones. If rough, unpolished stones can be smuggled out of the country and back to Sri Lanka, they can be refined and sold on at an extraordinary market. At 6pm, the single street town comes alive as miners return from the field for a treacherous two-hour negotiation for the sale of the day's pickings. They crowd around the tiny grilled windows that line the street and watch as a Sri Lankan inside sorts through their finds. The street is washed in the focused light of a hundred tiny gem torches shining through stones, looking for imperfections and inclusions, anything to drop the price. We find ways to send rough stones out of the country. If I find a good stone, I fly back to Switzerland to get a certificate on which I can nominate the origin of the stone. I make much more money if I say I got it from Sri Lanka. Uh, this I take go to Sri Lanka after we put this burn. Uh, after coming this color again, 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 come blue. Blue color come. It's we are called baby blue. And that's gonna, that, take, that takes a high price in market. We imagine planes full of buyers lifting off from this treasured island, their shoes, their jacket lining, full of shimmering, deep blue jewelry. We are not a city. We have no name, no mayor, no bank, no map. A hidden black market supply chain connects these two choreographies. From the lawless mine sites to the jewellery stores, hip-hop music videos and celebrity red carpets across the ocean. Unknown fields has used the amount of rice the human conveyor belt consumes in a day to manufacture a precious stone that embodies the systems through which these worlds are intimately and profoundly connected. The red Madagascan rice growing endemically on this treasured island is a staple food of the miners and has been collected locally and shipped to gem specialists for a carbon analysis. By subjecting the rice to extreme heat and pressure in the lab, Unknown Fields has formed a synthetic stone encoded with the sum of the human conveyor belt's labour. After manufacture, the gemstone has been set into a gold tooth, ready for that million dollar smile and the outrageous lyric. From killer jewels to carrots to the nightclub. In the glare of this cheeky gold grin, we see the cost of luxury, of beauty, 
of a daily allowance of rice, of 20 men shoveling at the bottom of a hole. It glistens in the light and mirrored in the facets of the rice diamond we see ourselves. In the same city, a camera flashes, a model pouts, a sharp cheekbone and the whip of a hip catches the eye on the catwalks. Fast fashion's rolling tide dumps mountains of cheap clothing on the high street shores, objects of desire worn for one wild night and destined to be discarded. Our second skin, an identity statement, our comfort and costume. It reveals and camouflages, empowers and imprisons. We pick at a loose thread on the garment we're all wearing and unravel it across continents from wardrobe to warehouse, from factory to field, in search of the landscapes behind our runway dreams and street blue jeans. Before we wear them, our clothes make journeys of tens of thousands of miles in their process of production, making textiles the most globalized industry on the planet. T-shirt cities and textile bounds span from field to factory and harvest vast cotton crops and silt-worn cocoons and draw yarns across deafening shuttles as rows and rows of automated looms weave the fashion fads of a distant world. Here, iconic rivers run with the colors of the season, as chemicals used in the dye process are dumped untreated to poison the land along the rainbow banks. Unknown fields reveal the unseen effects of the fast flashing supply chain. We follow it through the cotton fields, textile mills, dye yards, garment factories, and shipping ports of India and Bangladesh. The byproduct of this pace and scale of production is the destruction of the very thing that brought the industry to Southeast Asia in the first place. We meet the last generation of master weavers, a group whose skills now die with them. The apprentices they would once train now man the rumbling mechanised looms of global fashion. Raw cotton, plugging their ears, deaf to the din of the world around them. And we visit the last real gold thread maker, an alchemist, lovingly tweaking the machine his grandfather made, resisting the move to synthetic, cheap and fake yarns used by all the other companies around him. Spanning from fashion victims to victims of fashion, Unknown Fields have developed a film and collaborative textile that reveals the way traditional craftsmanship in the textile industry is being put at risk by the disposable nature of fast fashion. Working collaboratively with the last gold thread maker and one of the last true master weavers in Varanasi, Traditional craft expertise is drawn from to create a narrative fabric artwork and film. Audio from a series of interviews with these endangered craftspeople and the sound of their looms is translated into a binary pattern and woven into the cloth. The textile becomes an archive, encoded with the skills and stories of a dying craft and woven from the same hands that it's trying to remember. To make the thread for the textile, unknown fields followed the container ships that bring fast fashion to our shores all the way to their death, where after their 25-year lifespan, they returned to India and Bangladesh to be broken up and salvaged in the shipbreaking yards. Unknown fields collected fragments of this raw steel from the Bangladeshi shores, cut from the rusting carcasses of the dead ships, to form the core of the gold thread. It's a textile archive born from the skeletons of the industry that brought it into being.
The cloth covers a young Indian textile worker walking slowly on a sacred procession from her home village amongst the cotton fields to the huge mills and factories of the vast textile industry supply chain where she works. Her journey suggests the walk along the fashion catwalk and the path our disposable fashion takes in its global production and the path so many women like her have taken in moving from villages to the factories of the city. As she walks, she is gradually wrapped in the glistening gold textile, bearing witness to a series of transformations, weaving, dyeing, sewing, pressing. The film is set to the rhythms of the handloom. Fast fashion slowed to a pace of production that the planet can sustain. And her journey ends as she's completely cocooned, standing at the huge container port amongst the mega container ships that will export her and everything we wear to the West. For Unraveled, we have delved into the dressing up box, into the wild, whimsical and weird and wicked world of fashion, to look deep beyond what is reflected in its shimmering, gilded mirror. Behind the parties and the cash registers, the textile industry is remaking the world between the scale of the stitch and the planetary supply chain. In glittering gold, unknown fields weaves new connections and reimagines the relationship between consumption and production.